Welcome to A Canadian Investing in the U.S., a podcast and YouTube channel focused on Canadians buying real estate with host Glenn Sutherland. Welcome to another episode of Canadian Investing in the U.S. This week, my guest is Matt McKeever. This is awesome. I've been looking forward to getting Matt on the show for, I don't know, a couple months now. So I'm pumped. And I see, Thanks, uh, bud. I see you're in your new studio. I saw the uh, Facebook yeah. video with it. <laughs> Yeah, we're really pumped. I'm just really excited to start creating more content, right? I think uh, it's one thing way too many of us real estate investors overlook is the value in being a content creator. So, like, first of all, shout out to you for getting it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, I, I totally get that, too. You, uh, you you meet so many people, too, from doing it. Yeah. And that's, that's really the name of the game is to know as many people as possible. So Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um so let's uh, let's dive right in. I know uh, you're. I guess we will. You're retired, or you're you're working on your own company now. You don't you don't work. Yeah. You don't work for the man so, anymore. Exactly. So retired, maybe you know, no longer applies. But essentially, for those of you that aren't familiar with my backstory, uh, I'm 33 years old now. Uh, at 31, I kind of retired or stopped working as a CPA because I built up a real estate portfolio. I was able to sustain my lifestyle based off of that cash flow. So essentially, I call it retirement. And that was my original intention. Yeah. And then I kind of got bored about four or six months into it and, you know, started doing YouTube videos. And from that, some interesting businesses have spawned and uh, also just kept acquiring more and more real estate. So, you know, these days we're doing a lot in Windsor with student rentals and stuff like that. So it's probably not fair to say retired anymore. but. What's awesome is I'm in control of my time, right? And I think most of us, you know, there's lots of people that love their job. And the thing is, it's awesome to love your job, but sometimes your job can stop loving you, right? And so not every profession will necessarily exist 10, 20 years from now. And so I think even those of us that don't want to retire, there's still a lot of value in real estate investing and building up that passive income. Definitely. Totally agree. Okay, so you you've left your job. Let's talk about maybe some strategies. How do you how did you get there? Like what kind of what's what's your favorite kind of real estate? I already know the answer. It's a loaded question, but <laughs> yeah. So you know, I originally got started with student rentals, and that's how I built up you know some really strong cash flow. But the problem was when I got started with student rentals was I wasn't able to, you know, I could only buy a house a year with my current job or my job back then, and what that meant was. I wasn't able to speed up the velocity of my money and I found that frustrating because you'd see more opportunities and you'd want to be able to execute on them and I'd find myself sitting on the sidelines waiting to save up that money. And I started doing some joint ventures and things like that and that helped me, you know, keep my pace but it still wasn't letting me really blow up, I guess. And so then I kind of stumbled upon the idea of Burr investing and so I've documented that a lot on my YouTube channel. And so it's kind of one of the investing strategies I'm more well known for. And so for those of you that aren't familiar, BRRRR stands for buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. Or some people consider it flipping to yourself. Yeah. And so essentially, you know, focusing on that idea of finding really strong cash flowing potential properties that aren't living up to that potential right now. Go in, usually get vacant possession, uh, renovate, do strategic renovation. So one of my favorite things to do is, you know, install dishwashers or laundry. I find in my market in London, Ontario, you can increase rent by about $50 a unit if you install a dishwasher. And so I'll literally go on, you know, Kijiji or Craigslist, buy that used for $50 or $100 and pay someone $100 to install it. And the payback period is like four months. And same with laundry. You know, we can buy laundry units for maybe $500 used again, Kijiji or uh, Craigslist, and I can often increase rent somewhere between $75 and $125 a unit per month just by adding that feature. And then, you know, by increasing the rent, by fixing it up, by replacing flooring and repainting, often just refinishing kitchen countertops, or sorry, kitchen cabinets and replacing the countertops, often we're able to increase the rent from anywhere like 20 to 50% of where it was before, sometimes even more dramatically, then the banks realize that you know there's a value in that and they'll let us refinance at a higher valuation, pull that equity out, and ideally when we're doing this, and on my YouTube channel I documented where I bought a duplex for 110,000, spent 10,000 or 12,000 on strategic renovations, bank came in, appraised it at 150, 
And so essentially 80% loan to value, get a new mortgage for 120. I only have $2,000 tied up in the property. So what that allowed me to do was really speed up the velocity of my money. And with that, I was able to acquire a lot more properties. And then I started documenting on YouTube and that allowed me to track a lot more joint venture partners and just a lot more money in general. Is there any other kinds of renovations that you like to do? Yeah, so that's really one of my main focuses. And then obviously like, you know, I love refinishing hardwood floors. Uh, I'm often buying older Victorian homes, you know, so like houses or century homes. Uh, often they've been subdivided into multiple units and they'll have a lot of the character, the original character from when they were built. And hardwood floors, you know, to install them today is extremely expensive. However, to finish them, if you have the right connections, you know, meet the right contractor, we often can do it for like $2 a square foot. And that, that includes the labor. So when you compare that to even installing like vinyl plank, you're often paying $2 a square foot for vinyl plank, but then you still have to install it or pay someone to install it. Yeah. So refinishing hardwood floors is definitely one of my favorites. Also in the sort of neighborhoods I'm investing, people want to see that character. So they don't mind if it's scratched or scuffed or it doesn't look perfect because they see that as being character and a value add rather than a decrease. So again, we often, you know, really try and add little details. So in one of my apartments, what we did was we had a little book nook. And so we often like to have like a feature in each of our apartments that we can kind of point to that separates it from say the competition's units. And again, it's just, at the end of the day, everyone likes to love where they live. And so they want something to brag to their friends about. So if you can give them something to brag to their friends about, so for, you know, for a certain class of tenants, that's maybe a book nook. For another class of tenants, that might just literally be laundry and a dishwasher. So it's really just figuring out what, where your competition is at and just trying to like just be a hair above without spending a ton more to get there. Cool. Totally, like I'm just going to jump all over this, but in, yeah. in the States, what a lot of people are doing now, which is not as common in Canada. I know common in Canada is to uh, finish the basement and turn it into another suite. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the, the, what the Americans are loving doing is taking like a single car or a double car garage and basically turning it into a bedroom with like an ensuite and ripping the whole doors and get the whole, you know, and ripping all the siding off and redoing it so it looks like it was supposed to be like that. Prop. Yeah, and putting put yeah. a proper window in it. And so you when you look at it, you don't notice that it was a garage. You kind of can tell because, you know, it's like this shape. But, yeah. but anyway, they do, it, they do a job and I have that. And so, yeah, we actually just did that with one of our properties in Windsor. Okay. So it had like a large two-car garage that was extra deep. Yep. And so we converted that into two bedrooms, right? You know, it's really not that much more expensive. And the permits, I'm, I'm not the one that executed on it. My partner, business partner, John, is. But yep. my understanding is he says it's not that difficult because the, you're not changing the footprint, right? So it, in fact, it is like pretty valuable because in Windsor, for example, we're able to get somewhere between, you know, 550 to $700 per bedroom. So being able to add two bedrooms to it, to a house that obviously impacts your cap rate dramatically amazingly yes yeah that's exactly and then you know i know every time i talk to people i like and the re the sell value right but people are like who cares about the sell value i'm not i'm yeah. not planning on selling it but uh i'm definitely a buy and hold investor i know because but I, I get the i get the mixed ones right because there's like mm -hmm. about half the people i interview are buy and hold and about half of them are lease options and so they're they're yeah. unloading it every like few years right so it's it's like one or the other right or you're buying hold you know what i ever really don't get i don't think i've even interviewed someone who's like a full-on flipper like that's all they do is flipping they don't hold anything but maybe i'll have to get somebody on that get them to justify this for me because <laughs> 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 that to me that's just another job you're just going to work and work it, it's very active right <laughs> and so i think some of the most intelligent flippers i know they they use that to create the active income so they then can go buy the big multifamily properties and upgrade their portfolio. So yeah, I definitely I think it's pretty rare unless someone's say a contractor that gets into real estate investing for them to only go full time flipping. Yeah, and but that's when you watch television, that's all it is. It's that's all they show. Yeah. <laughs> it seems really awesome that, you know, within a couple months you can make all this crazy money, but there's a lot of things behind the scenes and like tax consequences too that slows down the velocity of your money where with burr investing there's no tax implications nope. until you actually dispose of the property so when you go to refinance a property what some people don't realize is there's no capital gains occurring there's no tax consequence whereas when you flip that property you know whether it's uncle sam or cra they want to get their cut yep and you can uh 
by doing a, being a flipper, you can, well, in the States anyway, you can be classified as a professional real estate and then, mm-hmm. and then it changes all your capital gains and you get really screwed up. <laughs> yeah. And same with in Canada, CRA in theory could reassess you and determine that it's an active business if you're doing it often enough, yeah. in which case it's going to be fully taxable. Yeah. Rather than you know fifty percent, which is our capital tax rate. Yeah, so I do the burr as well as you do the burr. Um, for you, do you uh, what do you use for lending? Do you uh, get like a private loan? Do you use cash, or do you actually get a loan and then break the loan and whenever you do the refi? Yeah. So what's interesting, and maybe you can uh, fill me in on how it works in the U.S., but here in Canada, in particular Ontario, Canada. We have like a really neat uh, mortgage product called the you know mortgage plus improvements or improvements plus mortgage, and what that allows us to do, uh, in particular, a lot of investors I know use uh, Scotia Bank or Bank of Nova Scotia, and the way that works is there's actually two appraisals that occur when you purchase the property, and they'll go through and they appraise it as is condition to make sure that it makes sense that it's an okay lending risk, and then they'll actually go through. And you'll provide them with your renovations. So you'll document either through contractor quotes or you'll show like the Home Depot cost if you're going to be doing the work yourself and break it out for them. And then they'll appraise what they think that property is going to be worth once you execute on those renovations. And what's really neat is it's kind of it's essentially the closest thing to a guaranteed burr you can get, to my knowledge. There's no such thing as a guarantee in anything, but it's closest thing simply because if you execute well and the market doesn't dramatically change between when you initially purchased it and once you finish the renovations, you'll get that evaluation. And so, for example, that's what I did with my uh, duplex that I document on my YouTube channel was, you know, did a hunt, bought it for 110000 then did 10000 renovations and the bank reappraised it at one fifty. And so when I originally explained to them the renovations I was going to do, they said, hey, that sounds like it's going to be a $150,000 property once we're done. And so, you know, that's that's how we're doing it with anything that's not too dramatic of a burr. So that's great for if you're doing like, you know, 10, 20, maybe 30 percent increase in the value of the property. But once you get into more dramatic things, you know, the best burrs, the best opportunities, I think, in real estate often come with cash purchases. So that's what, you know, I really love to do these days. Obviously, the reason you're buying in cash is probably it's not considered living condition. And so you can't get a mortgage, you can't get financing on it. And, you know, there's certain risks and complications that come with it. But again, we often find that we're able to get a much higher appraisal if we purchase in cash and then go to refinance rather than if we're, say, breaking a mortgage and trying to refinance. Yeah, because I know that there's, I won't list bank names, but I know in Canada, certain ones, if they find out that you went for long-term financing and then you go flip it in six months, you can get on there, like, basically they won't lend to you anymore. They'll be be very upset with you. So I I didn't even know that Scotia had a program like that. That's awesome. So I've learned something today, too. I actually have a couple (laughs) Scotia mortgages. I still have real estate here in Canada, too. I'm I'm, done. You both sides. I'm Everyone thinks I'm like, I've, I've sold everything in Canada, I've moved to the States. No, no, I still got properties here. I got Cambridge, Strathroy. I've got them around here too, but I still have I'm, most of my stuff's down in the States now. But what else? We can yeah, do? so I think the other great thing about burrs is because you're able to really speed up the velocity of your money, I found it's a great, great investment strategy to attract joint venture partners. So, you know, when you can pitch them on the idea of, hey, lend me X amount and I can keep recycling this. So what I love to do is, you know, do the burr, implement the burr where I'm the active partner and then I attract a money partner who qualifies for the mortgage and then has all the renovation and down payment funds. And I, I actually then follow through, the, you know, find the deal, execute on the deal and get it refinanced. And what I love about it is when you get into joint venture real estate, each one, like each new partner, that's a brand new relationship you need to manage. And so that's a whole new personality. I consider it like a long-term commitment. Yep. So being able to minimize the number of partners you have, I think is really a great strategy for a lot of investors, particularly when they're first getting started and they're trying to scale up. So if you can you know, speed up the velocity of your partner's money, if you can just keep recycling it, you're able to like have fewer partners with fewer money and yet keep executing and building your portfolio. So obviously, you know, if you want to reach financial independence, if you want to retire at a very early age, you need you're going to need actual financial assets to live off of. You're going to need cash. Yeah. So you're obviously going to need to either invest for cash flow or 
Alternatively, it's something that a lot of people overlook is you could do hard money lending, right? Yep. And you get above average returns. And as a real estate investor, say we want to retire early and truly be passive, I think hard money lending or being the, just the money partner on a deal execution is a great opportunity because still, because you have that experience, that background as a real estate investor, you're very familiar with the deals and I think you're going to have a much better ability to assess the risk when looking at the potential of whether you should lend through hard money or do a JV with a... Uh, active partner yeah and uh, if you have the money it doesn't mean go do it all yourself because if you're just yeah. buying it like if you're not buying them right and y you don't have the knowledge to do this right it's not as easy as it looks on tv you could end yes. up being way over budget and way like so many different ways you can get way off tangent and if you're starting it's actually a great way is to go do a couple jvs even say hey i want it i know i'm the passive partner but you know show me the ropes. I want to show, know how to do it myself. Yep. And if you're up front with people, like I'll be like, yeah, sure. I'll show you how I'll show you all my lenders. I'll show you the whole thing. It's part of the deal. <laughs> yeah. And we're, we're actively doing that now with YouTube viewers in Windsor, Ontario. And again, you know, people that are brand new to real estate investing often start with a very scarcity mindset. They're very scared of telling anyone anything about, you know, they won't tell you any of their lenders. They won't tell you any of their contractors. They don't want to share anything. Yeah. But what's really interesting, I find, is the bigger, the more experienced the investor is, the more willing to share they are because they understand that building that network, building that Rolodex, building your contact list is just so valuable because when you stumble upon that unique opportunity where you need to raise a ton of money fast, you need to have a relationship existing rather than, you know, I guess I see way too many young real estate investors trying to be the lone wolf. And I think that that's a great path to frustration and failing at real estate. And I definitely did it at the start, tried being the lone wolf and learned everything through the school of hard knocks. But the thing is with podcasts like your podcast or on YouTube and bigger pockets and just all these amazing resources and as well as like in life networking, there's no reason that you need to make every mistake yourself and learn every mistake through the school of hard knocks. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, Jumping back, I made a note about hard money rates, and a lot of people are going to see, hey, it's like these are you know, 10, 12, 15%, depending on who what you're talking, right? And the mm -hmm. people are going to go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would I ever do that? That isn't your mortgage. That's not what you're you, – you got to mm -hmm. drill into your head. This, is, this isn't the mortgage. This is just to get you through the refinance. Yeah, and so I think that's a great point. You shouldn't get emotional about whatever your interest rate is. It's literally just a mathematical – equation right so you figure out what your expected return rate of return is going to be on the investment you figure out what your cost of borrowing and executing on that deal is going to be if the spread is within the range that you find acceptable as an investment that's a great investment so i know investors that are happy to borrow unsecured at 18 or 20 percent because it fits you know they brand their numbers in their spreadsheet the numbers work they trust in their system and so they'll go execute yeah and doing a lot of this stuff without doing a burst strategy, it makes everything a lot riskier. Because <laughs> you're all yeah. of a sudden having so much money tied up in it. Yeah, absolutely. Because at the end of the day, your, your money partner, they worked really hard to save up that money. They're probably handing over either their entire nest egg or a significant chunk of it. And it's very important that you can alleviate their fears. And so, you know, the sooner they get back the money, the sooner all their fears will be alleviated. But I think it's even more important just because as a Burr investor, you know, we can separate ourselves from the other investors that are also trying to attract those JV partners. So that's that's a big consideration too, that those money partners have lots of alternatives. So it's that's why it's so important to always be out there networking, constantly be documenting the projects you're actually executing on because if people don't know what you're up to, it's really, like no one's gonna walk up to you and just be like, well, now because of YouTube, they sometimes do, but no one really walks up to you and is like, hey, I want to just give you $200,000, let's go buy a property, right? Like, that doesn't happen, so that's why you need to put yourself out there, that's why you have to network, and yeah. Do you use RSPs at all? Have you used RSPs from uh, an investor? Yeah, that's a great question. I personally haven't. I know lots of investors that do. Um, I'm actually currently in the process of trying to figure that out because, yeah. you know, one of the things is lots of people a lot of people when they first start saving, they start saving in those tax tax deferred or tax advantage accounts. So whether that's RSP or TFSA. And 
there's a lot of opportunity there if you can access it. So, you know, traditionally where most of my money partners have got their money from is just like a home equity line of credit. So, you know, they bought that house, whether it's just through hard work and paying down the debt or through appreciation, the gap's grown between what the property's worth and what they owe on it. And so they're able to access it through a home equity line of credit. And usually we're able to get very favorable interest rates at that as well. Um, so that's been my main focus, but we are starting to look more into that just because it's another tool to add to your tool belt. Yeah, it's it's usually very attractive to the person, the RSP holder, to the person that has that investment because often they've just thrown it in a you know a money market fund or they have it in some index or mutual fund where they they're not really even actively investing, right? So they don't necessarily really see their return. So as a real estate investor, when you can show them that like, no, I'm going to pay you this exact interest rate. This is the amount you're going to earn over this period of time. It's often, I find much better explained than what they heard at the bank when they signed up for that mutual fund RSP. Yep. So thanks for coming on the show, Matt. I really appreciate your time. That was uh, very informative. Awesome, Glenn. I really appreciate it. Great chatting to you, and also it was great meeting up with you in real life at the Ontario Landlords Watch. So yeah, I'm planning. On, uh, I've been circling and getting to more and more meetups and getting into like further and further out. And I've I went over to Matt Geertz's one in London a couple times. I'll have to get over to some of these other ones over in London and meet the rest of the yeah. guys. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We have an amazing community here in London, Ontario. So if any of your listeners are from geographically driving distance to London, Ontario. Find me on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram and uh, hit me up and I'll give you information. Tons of free meetups here and just a really great community. And honestly, if you're just getting started in real estate investing, build that community, build that network. It's the most valuable thing you can take. Again, thanks, Glenn. Oh, wait. Give them your spiel. Give them the uh, – where do they find you? What's your uh, what's your tag? Sure. So, yeah, you can find me on YouTube. So it's just my name, Matt McKeever. That's M-C-K-E-E-V-E-R. And you can find me on Instagram as well, Matt McKeever 85. There was a Matt McKeever that got there first. <laughs> and uh, otherwise, Facebook, Matt McKeever again. And, yeah, founder of the London on Fire meetup group here. It's a financial independence uh, retire early group. Also a co-founder of the Real Group, which is the Real Estate Alliance of London, just another amazing real estate meetup group. And as well, you know, we do all sorts of like online training and that sort of stuff. So anyway, just you can find me on social media. I believe in social media, so I should be easy to find. Awesome. And if you're uh, even farther out, if you make it to Cambridge, I will carpool with you the rest of the way. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, bud. All right. Thanks. See you. Well, that's it for episode 51. We are so close to hitting the one-year mark of the show. What I'm giving away for the one-year mark is the best-ever apartment syndication book that Joe Fairless wrote. Joe was uh, a guest on episode 18. Even if you don't win this book, I suggest you go pick it up. It's really, really good for uh, understanding multifamily and apartment syndication. So what you need to do if you'd like to get this book for free is send an email to glenn at glensutherland.com. In the subject line, say year one, and in the body of the message, just tell me where you subscribe to the show. If you're watching it on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, iTunes, uh, St Stitcher, where, uh, SoundCloud, wherever you watch the show, uh, just, just let me know. I'm just curious where everyone's uh, tuning in. Uh, thanks for your time, everyone. I will talk to you next week. Thanks. Bye.